Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 268 of our pharmacotherapy series which majors in tuberculosis. The first question reads, JPG, the 32-year-old wife of HTG from part 267 of this TB series, and their children are tested to determine whether they have been infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. For his wife, the induration from 5TU of PPD was 12 mm, which is reported as positive. JPG states that she has never received the BCG vaccine. The PPD results for the children were negative. JPG does not have any clinical symptoms or radiographic findings suggestive of active TB at this time, and her current weight is 60 kg. Is she at risk of developing active disease? What are the current recommendations for drug therapy for persons with latent TB infection? Should JPG receive treatment? Because JPG is a household contact of a person with active TB disease and has a positive tuberculin skin test, she is at great risk of developing active disease. During the first year after infection from the index case, a household contact's risk of developing active disease is 2% to 4%, and contacts with a positive tuberculin skin test are at the greatest risk. As with active disease, the tuberculin skin test is usually performed to detect the presence of latent TB infection. However, for contact investigation, studies have demonstrated that interferon gamma release assays are a more accurate indicator of the presence of latent TB infection than tuberculin skin testing. Therefore, many health departments in the United States have adopted interferon gamma release assays as screening tests for contact investigations. The majority of people with a negative interferon gamma release assay after exposure to a person with active TB disease do not have TB infection, however, the immune reaction to TB can take several weeks to develop so the interferon gamma release assay should be repeated 8 to 12 weeks after the last exposure to rule out infection. Tuberculin skin testing is preferred for screening children younger than 5 years old. Treatment of latent TB infection is effective in preventing active TB disease in patients with a positive tuberculin skin test or interferon gamma release assay result and in those at risk for reactivation of active TB, therefore, it is strongly recommended. Treatment decreases the population of tubercle bacilli and reduces future morbidity from TB in the groups at high risk for developing active disease. Because JPG is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis but does not currently have active TB disease, she should be treated for latent TB infection. There are four approved regimens for the treatment of latent TB. Isoniazid monotherapy prevents active TB in 90% of patients who complete a 9-month regimen compared to 60% to 80% of patients who complete a 6-month regimen. Therefore, isoniazid 300 mg daily or 900 mg twice weekly for 9 months is preferred. 
the twice weekly regimen should be administered by DOT to ensure patient adherence. A six month regimen is an acceptable alternative in patients who cannot complete nine months of therapy. The benefits of treating latent TB infection outweigh the risks of isoniazid induced hepatitis because all persons infected with TB are at risk for developing active disease throughout their lifetime. All patients receiving isoniazid should receive pyridoxine 25 mg per day to minimize the risk of peripheral neuropathy. Unfortunately, patient adherence to these isoniazid regimens is very poor. In a population of patients beginning isoniazid treatment for latent TB, only 64% of patients completed at least six months of therapy. Younger age, Hispanic ethnicity, and non-U.S. country of birth were associated with greater likelihood of completing therapy. Lower completion rates were associated with homelessness, excess alcohol intake, and experiencing an adverse event. In another study, 52.7% of patients receiving treatment for latent TB infection failed to complete the prescribed course of therapy. More than 93% of these patients were receiving isoniazid. Risk factors for failing to complete therapy included receipt of a nine-month isoniazid regimen, residence in a congregate setting, e.g. nursing home, shelter, or jail, injection drug use, and employment at a healthcare facility. In addition, this study reported that employees at healthcare facilities were more likely to decline treatment for latent TB infection. Because of concerns for isoniazid toxicity and abysmal adherence rates, shorter rifampin-based regimens may be utilized. Daily isoniazid plus rifampin for three months and daily rifampin monotherapy for four months are acceptable alternatives to isoniazid therapy. For the patients randomly assigned to receive daily rifampin for four months, 91% took 80% of the doses, and 86% took more than 90% of the doses at 20 weeks. For the patients randomly assigned to receive daily isoniazid for nine months, 76% took 80% of the doses, and only 62% took more than 90% of the doses at 43 weeks. Discontinuation of therapy due to an adverse events was more common in the isoniazid group, that is 14%, versus the rifampin group, that is 3%. Another study reported significantly fewer grade 3 to 4 adverse events and hepatitis and significantly higher treatment completion rates with 4 months of rifampin compared with 9 months of isoniazid. Rifampin for four months is an effective, safe, and cost-effective strategy to consider when treating latent TB infection in selected populations of patients. An attractive alternative for the treatment of latent TB infection is the combination of isoniazid and rifapentine administered once weekly for 12 weeks. In one study, patients received either isoniazid 15 to 25 mg per kilogram to a maximal dose of 900 mg plus rifapentine 900 mg with adjustments for patients weighing less than 50 kg once weekly for 12 weeks by DOT or isoniazid 5 mg per kilogram to a maximal dose of 300 mg once daily for 9 months. Completion of therapy was significantly higher in the isoniazid, rifapentine group, 82% versus 69%, with AP value less than 0.001. Overall, TB developed in 7 of 3,986 patients receiving isoniazid, rifapentine and 15 of 3,745 patients receiving isoniazid, hazard ratio 0.38 for the combination, with a 95% confidence interval of 0.15 to 0.99 with AP value equal to 0.05. Hepatotoxicity was higher in the isoniazid group, 2.7% versus 0.4%.
with AP value less than 0.001, whereas hypersensitivity reactions were higher in the combination group 3.8% versus 0.5% with AP value less than 0.001. Permanent drug discontinuation for any reason was higher in the isoniazid group, 31.0% versus 17.9%. With AP value less than 0.001, but permanent drug discontinuation due to an adverse event was higher in the combination group, 4.9% versus 3.7% with AP value equal to 0.009. The combination is recommended as an equal alternative to daily isoniazid for 9 months in patient 12 years or older with a greater risk of developing active TB disease. These patients include those with recent exposure to a person with active TB, conversion of the tuberculin skin test or interferon gamma release assay from negative to positive, or radiographic evidence of healed pulmonary TB. Isoniazid, rifapentine may also be considered in patients unlikely to complete nine months of isoniazid or in a setting where the combination offers practical advantages e.g., correctional facilities, or homeless shelters. The combination is not recommended in women who are pregnant or who expect to become pregnant during treatment. JPG should be placed on isoniazid 300 mg per day or 900 mg twice weekly for at least 6 months and preferably up to 9 months, rifampin 600 mg for 4 months, or isoniazid 900 mg plus rifapentine 900 mg weekly for 12 weeks. She should be educated and questioned frequently about the clinical symptoms of hepatitis, such as GI complaints. Pretreatment serum aminotransferases and lilirubin should be assessed to rule out pre-existing liver disease. The American Thoracic Society and the CDC do not recommend routine monitoring of LFTs unless symptoms suggest hepatotoxicity. The next question reads, JPG is started on daily isoniazid. After two months of therapy, she presents to the clinic complaining of nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Liver function tests were ordered, and her aspartate aminotransferase, abbreviated as AST, was 150 international units per liter. Discuss the presentation, prognosis, and mechanism of isoniazid-induced hepatitis. What are the risk factors for developing hepatitis? Should isoniazid be discontinued to prevent further liver damage? Approximately 10% to 20% of patients treated with isoniazid alone for latent TB infection will develop elevated serum amino transferases, which are generally transient and asymptomatic. Most patients with mild, subclinical hepatic damage do not progress to overt hepatitis and recover completely even while continuing isoniazid. In contrast, continuation of isoniazid in patients with symptoms of hepatitis increases the risk of mortality compared with immediate discontinuation. The risk of death from TB, however, is estimated to be 11 times higher than the risk of death from isoniazid hepatotoxicity. Isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity generally occurs within weeks to months of initiating therapy, 60% of cases occur in the first three months and 80% occur in the first six months. Constitutional symptoms may be seen early and may last from days to months. Nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain are seen in 50% to 75% of patients with severe hepatotoxicity. Jaundice, dark urine, and clay-colored stools may also be seen. Recovery may take weeks after discontinuing isoniazid therapy. The development of isoniazid hepatotoxicity has been linked to several factors, including acetylator phenotype, age, daily alcohol consumption, and concurrent rifampin use. Additionally, women may be at higher risk of death, especially during the postpartum period. The mechanisms responsible for isoniazid hepatotoxicity remain unclear. 
Previously, it was thought that rapid acetylators had a greater risk for isoniazid hepatotoxicity than slow acetylators. Rapid acetylators of isoniazid form monoacetylhydrazine, a compound that can cause liver damage, more rapidly than slow acetylators. Rapid acetylators, however, would eliminate monoacetylhydrazine at a faster rate, and this should equalize the risk of toxicity between slow and fast acetylators. One study demonstrated a different incidence of hepatitis between Asian men and women. Because both groups were fast acetylators, this study suggests that hepatitis is associated with factors other than acetylator phenotype. Some evidence supports the theory that isoniazid-induced hepatitis is a hypersensitivity reaction, however, many patients tolerate isoniazid on re-challenge, discounting this theory. Age and concurrent daily alcohol ingestion are the most consistent risk factors for isoniazid hepatitis. Progressive liver damage is rare in persons younger than 20 years of age. It occurs in approximately 0.3% of persons between the ages of 20 and 34 years, 1.2% of those between the ages of 35 and 49 years, and 2.3% of persons older than 50 years of age. One prospective cohort study, however, demonstrated a low incidence of isoniazid hepatitis. Of 11,141 patients receiving isoniazid alone for the treatment of latent TB infection, only 11 0.1% of those starting and 0.15% of those completing therapy, develop clinical hepatitis. Previous studies suggested a higher incidence of clinical hepatitis in patients receiving isoniazid alone, and a meta-analysis of six studies estimated the rate to be 0.6%. However, severe hepatotoxicity may occur with isoniazid treatment of latent TB infection. The CDC reported 17 severe hepatic adverse events with isoniazid in 15 adults and two children ages 11 and 14 years. Five patients, including one child, underwent liver transplantation, and five adults died, including one liver transplant patient. High-risk patients should be followed with routine monitoring of LFTs. These patients include those who consume alcohol daily, persons older than 35 years of age, those taking other hepatotoxic drugs, those with pre-existing liver disease, intravenous drug users, black and Hispanic women, and all postpartum women. In these high-risk patients, isoniazid should be discontinued if the AST level exceeds three to five times the upper limit of the normal value. Because JPG is experiencing nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain and her AST is greater than three times the upper range of the normal value, isoniazid should be discontinued temporarily until the AST returns to normal. At that time, isoniazid should be resumed, and her LFTs rechecked. If the AST increases again, the drug should be discontinued, and JPG should be followed frequently for development of active TB. The next question reads, CTM, an 80-kilogram, 35-year-old woman, is being treated for active TB disease with isoniazid 1,200 mg and rifampin 600 mg twice weekly. Is 1,200 mg of isoniazid twice weekly an appropriate dose for 80 kg patient? What isoniazid side effects, other than hepatotoxicity, should be anticipated? The usual twice weekly isoniazid dose is 15 mg per kilogram, with a maximal dose of 900 mg. Even though she weighs 80 kg, CTM should be receiving no more than 900 mg rather than 1,200 mg of isoniazid. 
although high doses or increased serum concentrations have not been linked with hepatitis, elevated serum isoniazid concentrations have been associated with increased central nervous system CNS events, ranging from somnolence to psychosis and seizure. GI complaints are also more commonly observed at doses greater than 20 mg per kilogram. We will now discuss peripheral neuropathy. Although uncommon at the recommended daily and intermittent doses, isoniazid can cause a peripheral neuropathy by interfering with pyridoxine that is vitamin B6 metabolism. As many as 20% of patients may experience this problem with isoniazid doses greater than 6 mg per kilogram per day. Numbness or tingling in the feet or hands is the most common neuropathic symptom. In patients with medical conditions in which neuropathy is common, including diabetes mellitus, alcoholism, HIV infection, malnutrition, and renal failure, supplemental pyridoxine 25 mg per day should be given with isoniazid. Women who are pregnant or breastfeeding and persons with seizure disorders should also receive supplemental pyridoxine with isoniazid. Next we will discuss allergic and other reactions. Allergic reactions consisting of arthralgias, skin rash, swelling of the tongue, and fever have also been reported. Isoniazid has been associated with arthritic symptoms and systemic lupus erythematosus. Approximately 20% of patients receiving isoniazid develop antinuclear antibodies. Other less common reactions reported with isoniazid are dry mouth, epigastric distress, CNS stimulation and depression, psychosis, hemolytic anemia, pyridoxine responsive anemia, and agranulocytosis. Regarding drug interactions isoniazid is a relatively potent inhibitor of several cytochrome P450 isoenzymes CYP2C9, CYP2C19, CYP2E1, but has minimal effects on CYP3A. Isoniazid inhibits the hepatic metabolism of phenytoin and carbamazepine, resulting in increased plasma concentrations of these drugs. Patients receiving either of these two drugs with isoniazid should be observed for signs of phenytoin or carbamazepine toxicity, such as nystagmus, ataxia, headache, nausea, or drowsiness. Plasma phenytoin and carbamazepine concentrations should be monitored periodically so that the doses can be adjusted if necessary. Carbamazepine also may induce isoniazid hepatitis by inducing its metabolism to toxic metabolites. In addition, isoniazid inhibits the metabolism of diazepam and triazolam. It is important to note that rifampin has the exact opposite effect on hepatic metabolism. Rifampin is a stronger inducer than isoniazid is an inhibitor as documented by the fact that isoniazid-rifampin combination therapy induces the metabolism of diazepam, phenytoin, and other agents metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. The next question reads, one month after beginning her twice-weekly DOT regimen, CTM exhibited symptoms of myalgias, malaise, and anorexia. Laboratory data were normal except for a slightly decreased platelet count. Could CTM's symptoms be related to her drug therapy? What adverse reactions other than hepatotoxicity should be anticipated in a patient receiving rifampin? A flu-like syndrome has been reported in 1% of patients receiving intermittent rifampin administration. This syndrome is rarely seen with usual doses of 600 mg twice weekly, but the incidence increases with twice weekly doses greater than 900 mg. The incidence also increases if the dosing interval is increased to one week or longer. Unless the symptoms are severe, discontinuation of the drug is unnecessary. Because CTM is receiving rifampin 900 mg twice weekly, her dose should be reduced to 600 mg and administered daily until the symptoms subside. Temporary administration of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug has been used to alleviate the flu-like symptoms. 
twice weekly therapy may then be resumed as long as the dose of rifampin dose does not exceed 600 mg. Regarding hepatotoxicity, rifampin or rifapentine are associated with a less than 1% rate of hepatotoxicity. Therefore, the risk of drug-induced hepatotoxicity is greater with isoniazid than with rifampin. On occasion, rifampin can cause hepatocellular injury and potentiate hepatotoxicity of other antituberculosis drugs. Although elevations of liver enzymes may be seen, rifampin is more likely to produce cholestasis, as manifested by increases in alkaline phosphatase and hypolilorubinemia without hepatocellular injury. Elevations of all liver function tests may be seen transiently during the first month of rifampin therapy, but they are usually benign. Next we will look at thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is more frequently associated with intermittent or interrupted rifampin administration, likely caused by production of immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M antibodies to rifampin. These antibodies likely fix complement onto platelets, resulting in platelet destruction. Hypothetically, intermittent or interrupted rifampin therapy results in increased antibody production. Once thrombocytopenia occurs with rifampin, its subsequent use is contraindicated because the problem will likely recur. Next we will discuss miscellaneous reactions. In addition to the side effects associated with high-dose, intermittent therapy, 3% to 4% of patients taking normal doses of rifampin may experience adverse reactions. The most common of these are nausea, vomiting, fever, and rash. Other reactions to rifampin include the hepatorenal syndrome hemolysis, leukopenia, anemia, and arthralgias as part of a suspected drug-induced lupus syndrome. Development of these latter reactions requires discontinuation of the drug. Next we will discuss acute renal failure. Acute renal failure has been reported rarely with rifampin. This hypersensitivity reaction may occur with both intermittent and daily administration and may last as long as 12 months. Rifampin should be discontinued, and other drugs, e.g., pyrazinamide and ethambutol, should be given. Doses of ethambiotol and pyrazinamide should be adjusted for renal dysfunction, if necessary. Both rifampin and isoniazid may, however, be given in normal dosages to patients with pre-existing renal failure. Next we will look at discoloration of body fluids. Another important characteristic of rifampin relates to its chemical makeup. It is an orange-red crystalline powder that is distributed widely in body fluids. As a result, it can discolor saliva, tears, urine, sweat, and cerebrospinal fluid. Patients using rifampin should be warned of this effect and cautioned not to use soft contact lenses because of possible discoloration. This effect may also be used to monitor adherence to rifampin therapy. Next we will discuss drug interactions. Rifampin is a very potent inducer of cytochrome P450CYP3A4 and also induces other cytochrome P450 isoenzymes, including CYP1A2, CYP2A6, CYP2B6, CYP2C8, CYP2C9, CYP2C19, and CYP3A5. Rifampin induces phase II drug metabolizing enzymes, e.g., UDP glucuronal transferases, or sulfotransferases, and expression of transporter proteins, e.g., P glycoprotein, multiple drug resistance protein 2, organic anion transporting polypeptide. Complete induction of these isoenzymes and transport proteins occurs approximately one week after starting rifampin and returns to baseline approximately two weeks after discontinuing the drug. Rifamycins differ in their ability to induce cytochrome P450 isoenzymes, in which rifampin is the most potent, rifapentine is intermediate, and rifabutin is the least potent enzyme inducer. 
Rifampin increases the metabolism of protease inhibitors, certain non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors NNRTIs, macrolide antibiotics, azole antifungal agents, corticosteroids, oral contraceptives, warfarin, cyclosporine, tacrolimus, theophylline, phenytoin, quinidine, diazepam, propanolol, metaprolol, sulfonylureas, verapamol, nifedipine, dultiazem, enalapril, and simvastatin. Although the patient is receiving rifampin, it may be necessary to monitor serum concentrations of the aforementioned drugs, when appropriate, or increase the dosages. Also, women who are taking rifampin and oral contraceptives should use an alternative method of birth control. When treating any patient with rifampin, the healthcare professional should carefully evaluate all concomitant medications for the possibility of drug-drug interactions. The next question reads, will the combination of isoniazid and rifampin increase the risk of hepatotoxicity in CTM to a greater extent than either drug alone? Some initial evidence suggested that the concomitant use of isoniazid and rifampin was associated with a greater incidence of hepatotoxicity. The mechanism was thought to be attributable to rifampin induction of the metabolism of isoniazid to either monoacetylhydrazine or to other hepatotoxic products of hydrolysis. Steele and colleagues performed a meta-analysis reviewing the incidence of hepatitis using regimens that contained isoniazid without rifampin, rifampin without isoniazid, and regimens containing both drugs. They found the incidence of clinical hepatitis was greater in regimens containing both isoniazid and rifampin versus regimens of isoniazid alone 1 but this effect was additive, not synergistic, and therefore expected. The use of the two drugs together, therefore, is not contraindicated, but caution should be used in high-risk groups such as the elderly, alcoholics, those receiving concomitant hepatotoxic agents, and those with pre-existing liver disease. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 269.